Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining. This is Paul Dale. I'm your presenter for today's webinar on Data Protector. Uh, it's my pleasure to be able to introduce the technology for you today. I typically have two types of people in the audience. Uh, the first are people who may never have seen or used Data Protector before, and others who may have used it in the past but really haven't kept up to date with it over the last couple of years. And it's undergone some very significant developments. Uh, I'd like to bring people up to speed in terms of what sort of the latest uh, activities are and also what the roadmap is going ahead into the future. So what I'd like to do during today's webinar is first to set the stage by reviewing some of the data protection transformations that are happening and actually have been happening for a while now, but then spend most of my time introducing Data Protector for you. It is a very comprehensive, truly enterprise class method of meeting all of an organization's data protection needs. So I'll mention what its architecture is, uh, the wide range of different environments and applications that it can protect, some of our newer capabilities like our enhanced automated disaster recovery, and then spend some time talking about integrations, particularly integrations with virtual environments such as VMware and Hyper-V, and our unique what we call federated approach to deduplication. I'm probably going to uh, speak about many things today, at least at an introductory level, more than will be of interest to any particular listener. So there is at least an implicit call to action here, which is to say, let's follow up with a discussion that's more focused on your particular challenges and needs. But all of the data protector capabilities are presented through a, what the marketing people like to call, a single pane of glass uh, user interface. To begin, there are sort of three major transformations that I can identify. The first is the surge in big data. I think almost all organizations now recognize that their data is doubling every year or two. And it's both inside and outside of the organization these days. It's all not all necessarily in one data center anymore. And this is really taxing IT budgets to be able to keep up with it and the IT staff time that's required to manage it. So it is in this context that deduplication has essentially become essential from a backup and recovery standpoint. While you might have one copy of your production data, you're going to have many copies of your backup data. And so this data explosion problem is much worse from the vantage point of backup and recovery. The second is the transition to virtual machines. Many customers are moving very rapidly in that direction. Some of them are 100% virtualized or intend to be. But I think in many organizations, there will always be some mix of both physical and virtual servers. Now, the use of virtualization creates additional challenges from a backup perspective, because suddenly there are many, many more uh, servers that need protection. But it also creates some opportunities to do new and different things from a backup perspective. And then finally, mobility is changing everything. And what I fundamentally mean by this is the fact that the notion of a traditional backup window has largely or completely disappeared. There's no notion of being able to shut everything down from midnight to 5 a.m. and to do that night's backups. I can do my online banking at 2 a.m. in the morning if I want to. Users expect that their applications will always be available, always be on. And so you have to be able to do the backups and restores while data application servers are actually in productive use. The Enterprise Storage Group does a survey every year or so about what the priorities are going to be within IT departments. This is a recent one here. It, you can see that improving data backup and recovery was the second most important thing listed. But the thing that I think is interesting about the chart is that if you look at all of these things, almost all of them relate to or are affected by backup and recovery. So things like increased use of server vir virtualization, major application deployments, business continuity, and disaster recovery programs. All of these types of things impact backup and recovery. It really is a top of mind topic within IT groups around the country and around the world today. And in the industry, there's a couple of acronyms that are commonly used in discussing this. And if you're not familiar with them, I'll introduce them quickly here for you now. On the x-axis of this chart, I'm depicting the recovery time objectives, the RTOs. The RTO says, well, how long does it take you to do a restore? And that can be measured in hours all the way down to instant. On the y-axis, I'm depicting the recovery point objectives, the RPOs. And the recovery point objective says, well, after you have done a restore, now how current is the data that you have to work with? And for most organizations, for most of their data, it's a very reasonable risk cost trade-off to say that if I have recovery times uh, measured in hours or minutes or even down to seconds 
and data loss after a recovery that's also measured in hours or minutes is really quite acceptable. And Data Protector as a software product is more than capable of meeting any such uh, RTO and RPO capabilities that normally forms the bulk of the data that an organization has. But there is also some data that's very typically requiring much more stringent RTOs and RPOs. And, and frankly, you can't meet those without hardware assistance. And the fundamental piece of hardware that we're talking about here are intelligent storage arrays that can take snapshots of running systems uh, very quickly and reinstantiate those snapshots if necessary also very quickly. Data Protector has been integrated with a wide range of different storage arrays so that from a single console, from that sort of single management interface, you can control, monitor all of the capabilities, the retention, the creation of array-based snapshots. You'll see that as I get into the discussion a little bit later in the, in the session today. So if you look at what Hewlett-Packard has done overall over the last couple of years, it is to produce a converged data protection strategy. We now have from the storage division a very modern storage architecture with our HP 3PAR store serves, our store once units as backup repositories, and from a software perspective, the data protector software that provides this comprehensive management support for backup and recovery operations. So it really does create a simple, efficient, and agile approach to meeting all of a user's needs. Some of the top points about Data Protector are listed here. I've listed them under the heading of Data Protector 9, which is our latest release. Not all of these capabilities, of course, are new with 9, but I, I certainly wanted to have a chance to sort of take a quick inventory here. The first is leading scalability. Data Protector hands down scales to larger organizations, larger environments than any other backup solution that's available on the marketplace today. And I'll demonstrate some numbers about that shortly. In Data Protector, the fundamental unit of management is what we call a cell. And today, you can have up to a, a trillion file names in one cell's database and up to 5,000 different servers or hosts involved in a cell. And cells can be combined together to com provide an even larger administrative domain, up to 50,000 clients. Data Protector has an absolutely unique approach to deduplication that we call federated deduplication. And I'm going to spend some time talking about that uh, a little bit later in the webinar today. We also have extremely comprehensive virtual environment support. This is an area where we are continuing to do new and interesting development. Uh, we've already progressed very, very far along. And in fact, we have a long history of this. And Data Protector actually integrated with VMware version 2.0 you know, many years ago. But we're right up to date now uh, with vSphere 5.5 and vCloud Director 5.5. We have a new enhanced automated disaster recovery capability which allows you to do physical to virtual recoveries or, or recoveries onto different hardware platforms. I'll talk about that. And we've always had a very long list of different applications that we can protect on a very wide range of different operating system platforms. So it really has come a long way over the last couple of years. Uh, we've merged HP software and autonomy software groups together. We have all these different integrations with different applications, with different storage arrays, with uh, VMware, with Hyper-V. And, and by the way, more are coming. This isn't the end of the line. This is the overall architecture for Data Protector. At the top, in the center there, you can see the cell manager. This is a collection of services. It can run either on a physical server or on a virtual machine. The sort of fundamental thing that it manages is our internal database, our catalog database. And the cell manager will be on the local area network, depicted in blue here. And it is the server that supports the user interface, the administrator's console, as the management facility for Data Protector. Also on the local area network here, you can see off on the left, you'd have maybe some number of servers, you know, some of which might have locally attached backup repositories, tape or disk drives, uh, many or most of which probably would not. But somewhere else on the local area network, shown further on the right here, you might have a server that's a backup server. And what makes it a backup server is that it has attached to it or is responsible for managing some sort of file repository, you know, tape or disk drives typically. And in the middle, you can see servers that have their primary storage on storage arrays on a storage area network. And the storage area network is depicted in red. And on the storage area network, you could also have backup devices uh, like tape drives or virtual tape lives. So to take a, 
a little bit deeper dive here. If we look at the cell manager, it really is the brains of a data protector environment. The cell manager services are available for HP UX, for Windows, and for Linux. And as I said, it provides a range of different services. Uh, I've mentioned the database once already. That's sort of the fundamental thing that uh, exists on the cell manager. But every time a backup job starts or a restore session starts, a little session manager is created for that. And it manages and oversees that particular activity. It's also the place where you can run the installation server. The installation server makes the deployment, the upgrading, uh, the reconfiguration within a data protector cell extremely simple. I am going to do a little demo of the data protector user interface uh, later and you'll see the installation server come into play at that time. The next sort of component I want to introduce is the disk agent. Disk agents reside on any server from which data is being protected and to which data could be restored. And it's responsible for all of the I.O. activity, all the read and write activity associated with that particular server. We have disk agents available for a very long list of operating system platforms. You can see them there in the box on the right hand side. And what disk agents do fundamentally is exchange data with media agents. Now a media agent is going to run on any server that is responsible for managing a backup repository. And so it's responsible for all of the I.O. activities to that particular backup device. And what disk agents and media agents do is exchange data with each other. And, and once again, we have media agents available for a, a long list of different platforms. It's essentially the same list that you saw a moment ago. From a repository standpoint, Data Protector can support really any of the available repositories. We certainly support tape libraries. These have been around for a very long time. Uh, we support from the very simple single slot, single drive library all the way up to complex, robotic, multi-slot, multi-drive libraries. And under our advanced backup to disk option, we can support any type of disk space being used as a backup repository. We refer to that as a file library. And with file library backups, you have some more advanced capabilities that are possible, such as being able to form a synthetic full backup from time to time from a collection of uh, incrementals that have been created. We also support virtual tape libraries. Uh, these are disk units that emulate tape libraries, but of course there are no tapes. Everything is uh, kept on disk. My slide is actually missing this because it's brand new and I need to introduce something here. We now have the option in Data Protector 9 to use cloud storage as a repository. So the HP cloud can now be a target that receives backed up data from within a data protector cell. Now I'm introducing this notion of enhanced automated disaster recovery at this point because it's a very sort of fundamental capability in Data Protector. It's not a separately licensed or separate option that you have to acquire. With even the most basic Data Protector licensing, this is a capability that you get. And it is our bare metal recovery capability. And it can operate from any existing file system or image backup of a server. So you don't need to make separate backups that are intended to be used for full system recoveries. Any existing back full system or image backup will do. And inject different hardware into the bare metal recovery process. So we can construct a bootable ISO image from any of these backups. But at that time, if you want to, you can put different drivers into the image so that you can do physical to virtual recoveries or recoveries onto different physical hardware environments and these ISO images can be delivered on USB drives or tape or over the network. So this is just a, a very sort of a simple example of how or when it might come into play in an overall deployment. If you had a remote office, branch office situation such as shown here on the left, uh, you might or might not have a local backup repository there. Maybe this branch office is backing up directly over the wide area network to a central data center someplace, but perhaps there's a local storage device, a store once device in this example there. If there's a catastrophic server outage at that office, the central administrators can create a restorable image for that server, either based on backups that are kept at the central data center or locally kept on something like a store once device. And then if necessary from the central data center, deliver it maybe via FTP or something to the remote site as a way of providing a recovery capability there for complete outage, complete server outage uh, situations.
the next component that I want to introduce is what we call online agents. I actually think the name is a, a little confusing because the word online can mean so many different things today. What it means here is the fact that we can back up databases and other applications while they are online. We have software that knows how to take advantage of, to use the programming interfaces associated with a wide range of different database systems. You can see them in blue on the right hand side here. So Oracle and SAP and SQL and Exchange and SharePoint and so on. So that we can back up and protect those databases and applications while they are online. Online agents work with disk agents and media agents and once again we have online agents available for many different uh, platforms. With Data Protector, there are two different licensing models available. The first is what we call traditional licensing, and this is basically a la carte licensing. So you buy component licenses, uh, advanced backup to disk licenses, or online agent licenses for whatever number and types of databases or disk space it is that you might have, the number of tape drives you might be using, and, and so forth. Capacity-based licensing has been introduced fairly recently, and with this, you're licensing just a number of terabytes of primary storage that you need to protect. And it doesn't matter how many different components within the data protector library you use, how many instances you use, how many backup copies you make, how long you keep those backup copies. All we're measuring is the amount of primary storage that you're protecting. Uh, so this provides a very simple, straightforward method of licensing the data protector capabilities. These licensing models, traditional and capacity-based licensing, cannot be combined. So it is a decision that customers need to make about which model they want to use. Uh, that You can't migrate from one to the other, and, and they can't coexist within the same environment. You need, to, you need to choose one or the other. But overall, what we have found in the marketplace is that Data Protector is very affordable. For many customers, the component licensing turns out to be the least expensive way to go. And with that, what you do is you start with a starter pack. This provides you with a perpetual right to use license for the cell manager services, one tape drive license, the right to use the installation server, and an unlimited number of disk agents and media agents. So if all you needed to back up was a set of file servers to a tape drive, that's literally all you would need. But more typically, you would then add other component licenses as required by your particular environment. And in this regard, I want to make one special note that the online backup licenses are interchangeable. They're not tied to a specific database or application. So for example, if I have an Oracle database, I need an online backup license to back it up. But if I phase out Oracle and start using SQL tomorrow, I don't need to come back and buy a different license. The online backup license that I already have is usable against any of the different applications or databases for which online software capability is available. And you don't need licenses to use a store one's catalyst device or to use software-based deduplication. This may make more sense a little bit later when I introduce deduplication and store one's hardware units. From a capacity-based pricing standpoint, two models when this make, makes particular sense is A, if an organization is undergoing a rapid change or will be undergoing change and a customer doesn't want to have to come back and relicense or buy additional licenses from us. So if you have a, a dynamic environment like that, just having free reign to the catalog of components makes sense. On another case is if you have particularly in Unix settings where the component licenses can be expensive, if you have a complex environment, it can be cheaper, in fact, to just use the capacity-based licensing. Uh, this is just one slide that quickly illustrates some of the different licensing components that are available under the traditional model. We've mentioned a few of them here, uh, but certainly their drive and tape library licenses, advanced backup to disk licenses, uh, granular recovery extensions, down, zero downtime backup licenses. You'll, these will probably all make a little more sense later in the webinar. So from a platform coverage standpoint, we've got disk agents for a long list of systems. Uh, same thing for media agents. Uh, cell manager software available for Windows, HP UX, and Linux. And these online backup capabilities available for a wide range of different applications. There's three in particular that I'm going to mention here, uh, VMware, SharePoint, and Exchange. So let me uh, do that by starting with Exchange. 
Data Protector has several places, a number of examples of what we call one-touch protection. And this is the first one that I'm going to mention. So with the newer versions of Exchange, where there are distributed access groups, there can be many different uh, databases, there can be many instances of any particular database. It can be difficult for a backup administrator to keep up with, to understand the overall Exchange deployment. And you don't have to, because you can check off an entire group here, and then each time the backup spec runs, it will automatically apply the backup policy to the environment as it exists at that moment. So whatever databases are active or passive or have come into existence will participate in the backup scheme uh, in the proper way. So for example, here's a policy specification that says we want to minimize the number of hosts involved in the backup process. We'll see this one-touch protection in other examples uh, a little bit later. The next topic that I want to introduce is what we call granular recovery extensions, or GREs. We have these for SharePoint, for Exchange, and for VMware. And what these are, in essence, are plugins that allow, in this example here, a SharePoint administrator to recover data without ever having to go to the backup system, without having to have an account or use the data protector interfaces. So right within the SharePoint Central Administration Console, they can browse the available backups, select particular documents, and have them restored all within the context of SharePoint itself. We can also do that for Exchange. So an Exchange administrator can do individual message, individual mailbox restores without ever leaving the Exchange Management Console. It just becomes essentially a native part of the extended capabilities that we can provide to the Exchange administrator. And for vSphere operators, uh, for in VMware world, similarly, a vSphere operator can browse the available backups, select particular files, folders, directories for restore. Now, one of the newest changes that's happened in the latest Data Protector 9 release is that this granular recovery extension has been improved so that you no longer need to stage the backup to a temporary space out of which you then select the particular files and folders that you want to recover. Right from the backup medium itself, our smart cache, you can restore particular folders and files through this granular recovery extension. Zero downtime backup is the next topic I'm going to introduce. It's very, very much related to that RTO, RPO chart that I had at the beginning. Well, what it refers to is the ability that Data Protector has to centrally manage multiple array-based snapshots for critical applications, typically uh, databases or virtual machines, in either a virtual or a physical environment. And Data Protector is able to integrate with all of the different HP storage arrays and also with a range of other third-party storage arrays, such as those from EMC and NetApp and others, uh, to provide this zero downtime backup capability. With this ability, Data Protector can be used as the control console that controls when snapshots are taken, how long they're retained, and how they are copied or moved or backed up to other media, to backup repositories for longer term recovery or off-system off uh, protection, and to reinstantiate them. Now this is an area where, uh, one of the areas where we continue to do new work. So in some of the more recent re Data Protector releases, 8, 8.1, and, and now Data Protector 9, We've added a number of newer uh, improvements and capabilities, which I'm just going to mention here. The first is, for Oracle and SAP snapshot management, we now have that available on HP UX and Linux platforms. We've always had it for Windows. And we are now integrated with the 3PAR Recovery Manager for Oracle. So if you are running Oracle on some other platform, say Solaris or AIX, you can let the 3PAR Recovery Manager orchestrate the snapshots and orchestrate recoveries from that. And Data Protector knows how to use, integrate with the recovery manager for that purpose. So you still have this sort of single pane of glass uh, management capability. We've added active bandwidth throttling to our storage array support. We've added support for store one's virtual storage appliances. I'll mention those uh, a little bit later. And we've added IPsec encryption to and from these uh, store one's devices and support for the latest uh, tape libraries. Now, related to zero downtime backup is the notion of instant recovery. There's really two meanings to this. First, 
it refers to the fact that through Data Protector you can have a captured storage array snapshot instantiated as a uh, rollback as a replacement for a corrupted or deleted situation basically instantly because the storage array is very quickly able to reinstantiate one of the snapshots that still resides on the storage array. But we can do even better than that. With Data Protector we can actually take a storage array snapshot of a database and roll it forward to any specified second in time. So in this example, there, someone's trying to restore a database back to 7.16 and 46 seconds a.m. in the morning. The way that works is that Data Protector is able to roll forward the database transaction logs to the specified second in time. And so not only do we reinstantiate the storage array, but without any third-party software, database utilities, scripts, uh, separate programs, or DBA involvement, we can recover that database right down to the second that someone specified on the, on the screen that you see here. Now, next topic, I'm, I'm moving along, uh, virtual environments. These have become, as I noted at the outset, very important in organizations today. Uh, we have a virtual environment agent. Uh, it works with both VMware and Hyper-V. We are VMware Ready Certified for vSphere 5.5 and also for vCloud Director 5.5. We have this single item recovery capability that I've already mentioned, but before I talk any further about backup of virtual machines, I think it's worthwhile just kind of reviewing the different methods that are available. I find that people tend to get focused on one method or another and you really have quite a range of choices with Data Protector. The first is what I would call offline backup of virtual machines. So if you have virtual machines and they are regularly shut down for an extended period of time, they exist on the hypervisor just as one or several different files and you can just back them up with an ordinary disk agent. You don't need any special licensing or special software capability to do that. But more traditionally what people have done is install data protector components right within the guest systems themselves, right within the virtual machines. And there are almost certainly times when you want to do that. For example, if you are running Exchange in a virtual machine, you almost certainly want the in-depth, tight integration of our online Exchange backup agent by having it execute inside the guest system itself. But even more recently, what people have turned their attention to is the vStorage API from VMware. It's called VADP. This allows backup software, such as Data Protector, to create and then capture full virtual machine image snapshots for backup and recovery purposes. And I have a slide about that in just a second. We can also do a similar thing with Hyper-V console snapshots, i.e. capture full Hyper-V virtual machine images for backup and recovery purposes. And as I've already mentioned al already, we also have zero downtime backup, which is associated with storage arrays. So rather than interacting with the hypervisor, one can elect instead to interact with the storage array on which virtual machines are being kept and then capture and recover uh, storage array snapshots as, as a method of protecting your virtual machine environments. This is just one slide to illustrate the use of the VADP API. In this illustration you see three ESX servers on the upper left there. Uh, there's a vCenter server shown in the center and a data protector cell manager. There's also in blue on the lower right a backup host. And what makes it a backup host is it's running the data protector virtual environment agent. This is the entity that's actually going to use over the local area network the VADP API to make programmatic calls and interfaces with vCenter to cause vCenter to take virtual machine image snapshots which probably are or typically on a storage area network device which the backup host can then mount and capture to tape libraries or really any of the available repositories within the data protector environment. The alternative that I mentioned is to use array-based snapshots where in, now we're talking to the storage array having the storage array take snapshots which the backup host can mount and capture to any of the available repositories within the data protector environment. Another aspect to virtual machine protection is handling what people call virtual machine sprawl. It's become so easy to create virtual machines 
that they tend to get created quite readily and it can be very difficult for a backup administrator to keep track of all the virtual machines within his or her environment. So this is another example where we offer one touch protection. Uh, you can click off a, a group of virtual machines and then every time this backup spec runs data protector will discover what virtual machines are in existence and then back them all up appropriately. Virtual machines, as I mentioned, is an area where we continue to make improvements. Some of the improvements that we made in versions 8 and 8.1 are shown here. We've always been able to restore a virtual machine that gets corrupted or deleted, but now in 8 and 8.1 we can actually take the corrupted virtual machine and set it aside under a different identity under what we call our Keep for Forensics option. So if a virtual machine goes bad, you probably want to get a backup replacement for it in production use as quickly as possible. But with this option, you can keep the corrupted machine around for diagnostics or discovery purposes to, to sort of understand what happened or is happening. We can also allow you to restore a virtual machine under a new ide or different identity without affecting the production version. You might want to do that, for example, if you're restoring a machine from six months ago for some sort of analytics or data mining purpose or if you want to test to see if your virtual machine recovery capabilities are going to work the way you expect without actually affecting any of your production virtual machines in operation. In DP9, as I mentioned, one of the newest improvements we made is the introduction of what we call a smart cache which supports these granular recovery extensions without the need for an intermediate staging area. Without smart cache, the way GREs worked is that you would restore a particular disk drive into some temporary space out of which the GRE plugin could extract the particular files or folders that were desired. But with the smart cache backup repository, we can actually look right into the repository itself. There's no need to restore complete disk drive letters or drives in order to do individual item recoveries from backed up virtual machines. We've also made performance improvements. Uh, we've made browsing three to five times faster within the um, interface. This is particularly important for customers that have hundreds of virtual machines that they may need to view or work with. We've also made backup 25% faster through better memory usage and just generally better computer science implementations of backup techniques. We are the very first backup software to fully integrate with VMware's uh, vCloud Director. This refers to the VMware's ability to not just virtualize a server, but to virtualize an entire network infrastructure. So there's an awful lot of metadata that's associated with this. It allows, for example, a, a service provider to have multiple independent networked environments uh, built and delivered on a common set of hardware components, each of them completely separated from the other. Backing up a complete vCloud requires a lot of metadata associated with that. We do that. In fact, this is another example where we offer one-touch protection. So if new virtual and network environments have come into existence, then each and every time the backup spec runs, it will discover what's there right at the moment and then back them up according to the desired backup specification. We've also continuing to work with Hyper-V. One example of that is that we now can use SMB version 3 to capture Hyper-V snapshot images that reside on NAS devices. So in an environment, uh, maybe a little bit less expensive environment that doesn't have a storage area network where network detached storage is being used, we can capture those virtual machine uh, images from a Hyper-V environment. Now I want to turn to deduplication. This is a, an important topic from a backup standpoint and it is a particularly strong capability within Data Protector itself. There's really sort of two parts to the discussion. The first is that a number of years ago now, HP Labs developed a new set of mathematical algorithms for doing deduplication, for detecting common data patterns in the stream of data. This has now been productized. It's called Store Once. Uh, it's implemented both in hardware and in software. Uh, the performance is really excellent. Uh, you can see a uh, 1.8 terabytes per hour as a dedupe rate on a, just an ordinary server hardware. But in our Store Once units, we can dedupe at over 140 terabytes an hour. And in doing this, particularly for example in the software implementation, we only need a tenth of the memory of competitive solutions. I mean, it's so efficient that you can do it right within a virtual machine. 
And what we've done from a data protector standpoint is allow the deduplication to occur anywhere within the topology. So starting at the bottom here, if you use one of the HP Store One's hardware units, then it is the hardware that's doing the deduplication. The backup server will send a non-deduplicated data stream to the Store One's unit, which will deduplicate it, and thus you need only a fraction of the physical storage on that storage device compared to what you would need if you did not have the store once deduplication. But instead of letting the hardware unit do it, you can let the backup server do it. I can have the store once software implementation running on the backup server. It then does the deduplication, and then it can send a deduplicated data stream either to a store once unit or really to any type of disk space to create a deduplicated repository. And finally, I can run the store once deduplication library right on an application source server, so right on the machine where the database or files reside that need to be backed up, I can let the, the deduplication occur there. And there are various use cases for this. On this particular slide, I'm showing three. On the upper left there, you see a, a, a large, what we call remote office or branch office site where there are multiple servers. There's a backup server. And there might be one of the smaller HP Store Once hardware units there as the local backup repository. And in this case, either the hardware unit or the backup server can be doing the deduplication. And now, if I needed or wanted to have off site copies of those backup files, say at a primary data center or at a DR site, I need only a fraction of the bandwidth that I would otherwise need because only the deduplicated data is going to get replicated across the wide area network connection. In a medium-sized site, shown in the middle there, I probably don't want the extra expense of a separate backup unit, but I can have a backup server, and it might have some local disk space that I'm using for backup. I'm letting the backup server, in this case, for certain, do the deduplication. And once again, I'm doing a low bandwidth replication of just deduplicated data across the wide area network if I need off-site or want off-site protection. At the very smallest site depicted at the bottom here, there's no backup storage, there's no backup repository at all. Instead, I'm just running the Store Once library there, and it is generating deduplicated backup data stream directly across the wide area network to a Store Once device located remotely. In this case, it's illustrated as being at a DR site here. So again, only a fraction of the bandwidth is needed as compared to what would be needed if you didn't have this. One of the advantages of this store once deduplication is that it is the same algorithm. No matter where it's implemented, either in hardware or in software, you can adapt the configuration, you can change your mind, you never have to rehydrate stuff. It's always the same deduplication. Now, I do want to introduce the HP store once uh, portfolio. These are the hardware units that are available that have the store once capability built right into them. The very smallest ones only have a couple of terabytes of usable space. The largest one, the 6500 series, can have over 1700 terabytes of usable disk space. With these units, there is a programming interface, an API. It's called Catalyst. It is an open API. There are other backup software out there that are able to use the Catalyst API. But HP Data Protector software and HP hardware store once catalyst units really do work better together. Uh, they were developed together. Data Protector is able to fully utilize all of the catalyst capabilities to manage the deduplication, the replication of deduplicated data. And we've now added support for the virtual storage appliance. The store once VSA is a software package which makes a virtual machine into a store once logically into a store once catalyst hardware unit it delivers the full store once catalyst api so that it allows someone to have the advantages of the store once catalyst capabilities without actually physically having to have hardware that they can do it in a virtual machine environment and data protector can support manage all of these through a complete utilization of the uh, catalyst api in DP9, there's some further improvements that have been made in this. We can eliminate the line between backup data and rigid backup targets, so you can have several different federated backup stores all located on one store once unit. 
Uh, this allows, for example, to have different pools for file servers and databases and virtual environments all on the same uh, backup storage. And also in Data Protector 9, we've now introduced HP Helion object storage as a new type of repository within the Data Protector world. So instead of saying I want to send the data to a disk or a tape type drive, you can say I want to send it to the HP cloud, the HP Helion cloud, and then over the wide area connection that data is encrypted and transmitted to this HP provided storage service. So it provides the ability to have both on-site and off-site backup of data streams, particularly uh, critical data streams, within a company's environment. We've added cloud-ready backup as a service to uh, Data Protector 9 so that if you are a service provider and you want to have multiple independent operations on one single storage unit, you can do that. Finally, I want to mention that encryption is available within Data Protector. This is done by the disk agent before the data ever leaves the original server. If it is elected, it is separately licensed. It is the advanced encryption standard with a 256-bit length key. And all of the cell manager traffic is also encrypted when you do this. From a reporting standpoint, I'm going to go breeze over this very quickly. We've always had a long list of different reports. Some of the more interesting ones are shown in red. Uh, we can help with service level agreement management. How do I track successes and failures? Uh, where am I meeting my SLAs? Where am I not? With capacity planning, how are data sets growing over time? Where are you about to run out of media? You can combine cells together in what we call a manager of managers environment to provide a global control of a large environment that consists of multiple cells. But the thing that is really interesting in Data Protector 8 and later is that the single cell capabilities have been expanded so greatly. We can have up to a trillion file names in one cell manager database, up to 5,000 clients in a cell. That's 200 or 100 times more than our competitors. Up to 100,000 sessions a day, twice or 10 times as many as our competitors. And backup speeds of over 140 terabytes per hour when you're using our Store One's hardware units. So I want to have a couple of minutes to do a brief demo for you of the data protector interfaces. What you should see now is a screen that's largely white in color. This is the data protector console. It is a very workhorse type of interface. It, it hasn't been gussied up with a lot of 3D color pie charts or things of that sort. But all of the wide range of different capabilities, the flexibilities, the opportunities for customization are all available within this interface. It operates through a set of contexts which you can select with a little drop down on the upper left here. So I can look at the different clients that I have, my user accounts, my devices, my backup jobs, my restore jobs, and so forth. I'm looking at my clients just at the moment, and you can see I have a cell manager, I have a SQL server, and I also have an exchange server uh, in this particular environment. But if I wanted to add another server to protection, I could right-click on clients and say I want to add a client. And now, very conveniently, I can browse around within my network and select the servers that I want to add data protector components to. So in this particular example, I have a file server, and we're going to add some data protector protection to that, so I'll put it on the add list. And when I click Next, I can choose which data protector components I want to install there. Well, since I intend to back up data from this server, I certainly want to have a disk agent. And suppose I wanted to do source-side deduplication. I want to do the deduplication right on this server itself. Well, in that case, I do need the general media agent, and I also need the Store One's software deduplication library. So I'll check those things off. And now when I click Finish, you'll see the installation server come into play it's going to push those software components out to this new system and then automatically start up those services. Uh, it takes just a second to do this, but we'll, we'll give it a minute to run here. Yeah, almost done. There, it has now finished pushing the software out. It's in the process of starting up those software components. And there, completed. And so if you look at my clients list now, I do have a file server as a new entity. So the thing, the next thing I might want to do is to create a backup specification for it. So I'll go to the backup context. And now if I look at my backup specifications, I already have some. I'm backing up the internal database and my SQL server and so on. 
But if I and I also have some file system backup jobs to find, but if I right click on this, I can say I want to add a new backup specification. We give you some templates that you can work from, but I'm just going to start with the blank file system template. Uh, I said I wanted to do source ID duplication, so I'll check that little box. And now when I click OK, I can browse around and choose what data it is that I want to protect under this backup job. Well, what we're interested in here is this file server, and I'm just going to pick out a very small amount of data. I'm going to go to the administrator's documents. Uh, so here's the, uh, the documents folder for the administrator account, and we'll back them up. I think there's sort of a half a dozen documents there. When I click the Next button, I can choose the repository to which I want to back up. Now, we're doing source ID duplication. I only have one store ones library. So that's certainly what we want to use here today. So I'll check that off. And I can give this backup job some kind of a name. Sample is OK. I can choose a retention. I certainly don't want permanent. So we'll just keep the backups for three days, for example. When I click the next thing, I can choose or create a schedule for when backups should run. So I can say when fulls and incrementals should occur, how holidays should be handled. And in the latest releases, we have enhanced this scheduler with what we call a prioritized based scheduler. So I can assign a priority to this job relative to other jobs so that in a complex environment, I can be assured that jobs with the highest priority are always run first or run with the highest priority. For today's demo, I'm simply going to skip over this, not actually create a backup schedule. We give you a little confirmation window and opportunity to review what you're doing. And then, if this was a job that I wanted to have run periodically, for which I had set a schedule, I would choose the Save button here. Uh, if I wanted to see how it will behave without actually moving any data around, I could use the Interactive Preview mode. But I'm just going to choose the Interactive Backup mode and just let the thing run uh, while we watch. Uh, it won't take very long, as I said. It's only going to be backing up a handful of documents here. There, the backup job actually has completed at this point. And now the next thing you might want to do is to restore something. So I'll go to the Restore tab here. And you can see if I look under this file system backups, I have this file server that we just backed up. And I can browse around and choose as much or as little as I want to restore. So the only thing we backed up was the administrator's document. So that's what's being shown for me here. There are some files there. If I needed to restore a couple of these, I could just check them off. And in fact, if I right click, if I had multiple versions, I could choose which version it is that I want to recover. I can choose the destination. Now, the default is to put it back into its original location, but I could restore it to a different directory or onto a different server entirely if I wanted to do that. If I had multiple backup repositories for this, I could choose where I want to fetch the data from, but I'm just going to click the Restore button uh, and let it go. There, OK. So there's many other things that you can do with this interface for things like databases and so forth. There's many different options available. This was just a very basic demo, but you have seen us install Data Protector components, create a backup job, and run a restore, sort of the basic things that you would expect to do. But there are some other very important topics that I want to have at least a few minutes to go over with you. So let me go back to the presentation materials. And the fundamental thing that I want to talk about is the road ahead. Data Protector has a very exciting future, which is under development even as we speak. What we are doing, fundamentally, is rethinking the whole proposition about data protection in the modern data center. There's suddenly collaborative applications, blade servers, virtual machines, always on applications, uh, multiple different platforms, physical and virtual servers. And what we think is that what's needed is not an ever increasing list of new features, but a new approach to backup and recovery. And fundamentally, what that approach is all about is in bringing intelligence into the backup and recovery world. So what we are doing is building what we're calling adaptive backup and recovery. And it really is going to change the game. It consists of, first, introducing real-time data collection analytics so that we can understand what is actually happening, what has happened with respect to backup and recovery within the customer's environment. 
and then be able to report on that, to be able to make recommendations for improvement or required improvements, and then eventually to be able to self-adapt, to automatically adapt to adju or adjust to be able to meet the desired backup and recovery SLAs and behaviors without a human having to be directly involved in that. If this is a phased approach, we have identified four different phases. The first is prioritization. That's available today. That was delivered in Data Protector 8, which allows you today as an administrator to control the relative importance of different backup jobs. The next phase is prediction. And we have also delivered that now with Data Protector 9. And what that allows an administrator to do is to rely on Data Protector to report on what has happened and to make predictions about what will happen in the future. And what's under development, what's planned, is the ability to have the Data Protector environment make actionable suggestions for what is needed or how improvements could, could be made, and then ultimately to be, as I said, self-adapting with, re with respect to those suggestions. This is generating a lot of buzz in the marketplace. The analysts are very excited about this. It is a, a new approach to handling complex, large-scale backup and recovery environments and situations. There are, of course, other things that we've done in the latest Data Protector releases. Uh, I've mentioned some already, but I also want to mention here that we've introduced application integration for memory-based SAP HANA databases in addition to the prioritization. This is just a screenshot that shows the new priority-based scheduler in operations. In Data Protector 9, we now have introduced the second phase, and it comes in two parts. We have a new capability called HP Backup Navigator, which is a very intelligent reporting tool, analytics tool, a predictive tool that can predict behaviors going forward into the future. And we've introduced a data protector management pack for Microsoft SCOM environments, which provides a visual, complete, entire data protector infrastructure view of what's going on within the uh, backup and recovery world. From an adaptive backup and recovery standpoint, we are now focused and able to deliver through Navigator hindsight, what has happened in the backup world, insight, understanding what is going wrong, how things are related to each other, and then foresight, predictions about what will happen in the future. This is a, a, a screenshot of some of the Navigator capabilities. It's a very in-depth reporting tool, very interactive. So if you have something like a red pie here that shows failed backup jobs, you can drill down into all the different systems, components, levels, logs that might be of interest to sort of help you figure out why you're having some particular problem. The management pack allows for, uh, storage administrators and backup administrators to have sort of a common vehicle to discuss what's going on in terms of uh, disk space utilization, bandwidth loads, uh, storage capacities, uh, backup activities, and so forth. And so I am really right at the top of the hour now. I, I do need to, to wrap up. And I'll do that by saying that Data Protector has come a long way, and it has now enormous breadth, far greater breadth than you'll find in other backup software. We support all the different hypervisors from a virtual uh, machine standpoint. We have an extremely long list of applications that we integrate with. We are available on a long list of different operating system platforms with very compelling capabilities like zero downtime backup, uh, federated deduplication, enhanced disaster recoveries. And now we have integrated cloud-based backup as a capability, compression, encryption, throttling, and the new adaptive backup and recovery techniques. And all of these are available on the wide range of different HP storage architectures, uh, store serve, store one, store all, store ever devices available from the HP storage division. My very, very final slide is a resources slide. You probably won't have a chance to write all of this down, but I do want to at least call attention to my email address. I am pdale, as shown near the bottom here, pdale at hp.com. And I really welcome any kind of comments or feedback or questions that you might have from today's webinar. I'll do my best to answer as quickly as I can. As I said, it's uh, just five characters long. It's P-D-A-L-E at 
hp.com. I really appreciate your attending today. I hope this was useful and interesting for you. And as I said, if you would like any type of follow-up, uh, pdale at hp.com. And thank you for attending.